one of the most helpful houseplant podcasts you will ever listen to, plant friends, as it has been thoughtfully designed to set you up for success far beyond a plant care tutorial or a history lesson. Today, this episode, Leslie and I help you prepare your houseplant first aid kit. What's a houseplant first aid kit, you might ask? Well, it's kind of what it sounds like. So as humans, we all likely have a first aid kit in our home or in our office filled with everything you might need for that unfortunate moment where an emergency happens. You cut a finger, you burn yourself, and you run to the kit that already has everything you need to bring yourself back to homeostasis to help you heal. You have it at your fingertips when you need it. Because when your finger is bleeding, that's not the time to start Googling which Band-Aids are the best and what antiseptic to use. You need that treatment immediately, right? And it's the same for houseplants. When you identify a pest outbreak or a fungus ailing your plant, you need to jump on that and triage it ASAP so it doesn't spread. And you can't waste time driving from garden center to garden center looking for what you need. Specifically, this is what I had to do last time I had whitefly infestation because I didn't have the sprays that I needed. And that time I wasted driving from garden center to garden center looking for what I needed was time that I let the white flies continue to multiply in front of my eyes, right? When you have an issue with your houseplants, you should be prepared to immediately jump on it and start getting that plant back on the right tracks ASAP. And so Leslie Halleck and I have made your life so easy with this episode. We have huddled, we have discussed and put together a list of what we think our houseplant first aid kit necessities would be, ranging from simple rubber gloves to high-level systemic and sprays. But most importantly, this isn't just a list of what you should buy to be prepared for in case of an emergency. It's a breakdown of exactly what each of the products do. So how many times have you been told to spray your plant down with neem oil, but we don't know what neem oil is. We don't know if it's good or if it's bad or like what it actually does to our plants. We don't know what systemics do. But at the end of today's episode, you're going to know, plant friend, you are going to be so empowered. You are going to be so ready to take on whatever houseplant problems might arise because as we all know, in plant parenthood, it's not if, it's when something is going to happen. Pests are part of the process. Fungal infections are part of the process. Overwatering, underwatering, mistakes, they happen. You can't avoid that, but you can be prepared to rectify whatever issue is happening when it happens. And that's what today's episode is all about. Can you tell I'm excited? I am so excited. We are going to grow so much joy today. So welcome back. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Hello, plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. I'm so excited to welcome you back to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast. Welcoming you back if you're a longtime listener. And thanks. If you are, thank you for showing up to this podcast every week. I so appreciate you. It's my life's honor to be able to create accessible, free plant care education for our community and help you grow joy through caring for plants successfully. I mean, come on, pinch me. And if you're new here, hi, welcome. I'm your new best plant friend, Maria. I'm the host of the podcast. I used to be an epic plant killer. Now I'm a happy plant lady helping everyone care for plants successfully and cultivate more joy in your lives. And speaking of joy, I have to say I'm recording this episode with a bouquet of the most gorgeous hand-picked flowers from my friend's garden. So if you've listened to any of our flower episodes, you know that I grow flowers to gift them. There is no better feeling than gifting a friend a bouquet of hand-cut flowers and herbs from your garden. And I had a party this last weekend and we had a friend bring me the most incredible bouquet of cosmos and dahlias and thistles, Queen Anne's lace, snapdragons. It's this wild, incredible bouquet and it's bringing me so much joy as I create these planty episodes for you. Sitting on my desk, keeping me company with Frankie. Frankie's my bird. You might hear him tweeting in the background. Anyway, today's episode is epic. Like I said, Leslie and I are going to break down everything we think you should have in a houseplant first aid kit. As Leslie dives in, we're thinking tackle box size, right? We're thinking like a small first aid kit, like a true first aid kit. But obviously, everything that we talk about is going to range in size, in price, in organic, not organic, in 
things you can order on Amazon, things from larger companies and things from small female founded companies, you know, smaller companies that we want to support. So just so you know, everything we talk about today is going to be in the show notes and in the blog associated with this episode. And we have coupon codes for a lot of these products for you in case you are interested in building your own first aid kit, or we have Amazon links for you as well. And those links are affiliate links. And it helps if you click through our affiliate links, because then the podcast makes a little bit of money for whatever you buy on Amazon at no cost to you. So thanks in advance. And please tag me and Leslie online with whatever houseplant first aid kits you put together for yourself. I'm shopping right now for the right tackle box or for the right like container because I want to make it really cute. But let me know what resonates the most with you and what you end up getting. This is a continuation of the Grow Better series with Leslie. It's a mini series on the podcast where my best plant friend, Leslie Halleck, she's a horticulturist. She's had decades in the hort industry. You've probably heard her from our previous episodes, but she's amazing. And we're going to link to all of her books as well because her books are incredible resources. And she's my best plant friend. And so speaking of plant friends, I wanted to give a shout out to a couple of new plant friends, Tammy B, Leslie T, and Chris J. Hi, plant friends. Welcome to the Growing Joy Garden Society. I'm so excited that you're here. I'm so thankful that you're supporting the show through your subscription to the Garden Society. And I can't wait to get to know you better in the platform. And if you're listening and you don't know what the Growing Joy Garden Society is, it's my iOS Android app and platform that you can access via your computer. It's a private, algorithm-free, troll-free community for our international community of plant friends where you guys can connect and make new plant friends, propagate your plant care knowledge, and grow more joy in your life. You can visit jointhegardensociety.com if you're interested in joining us. And it's also a great way to support the show because the subscriptions to the community help support my team of plant friends that create these podcasts for you, like my editor and my podcast manager and my community manager, all those people. So anyway, this is such an epic interview. It's pretty lengthy, so I'm going to dive right in. So without further ado, welcome to the DIY Houseplant First Aid Kit with Leslie Halleck. Leslie, I am so excited about today's episode. It has been requested from my podcast manager, Bailey. It has been highly anticipated from listeners who have heard the Easter eggs we've been dropping. I'm so excited that we're finally dedicating an entire episode just to what you need to put together in your houseplant first aid kit. Thank goodness. I wish I had this episode five years ago when I started caring for plants. Yeah. Well, how many times have you found yourself in a houseplant emergency? You know, you've discovered all of a sudden on your favorite houseplant, you've got a pest or disease problem or a cultural growth problem, and you need some products and tools And in that moment, you find out that you just don't have what you need handy. So yeah, I think in one of our last episodes, I dropped sort of a what I do, kind of my hobby pro tip for keeping a plant first aid kit on hand. And so we're going to dive into all the good stuff in our first aid kit that you should uh, keep on hand to do last minute emergency houseplant triage first aid. It's so true, especially like I remember I was texting you, I don't know, it was probably a couple of months ago now, but I had white flies for the first time. And thank God I had the magnifying glass that we're going to talk about. I was able to ID them, but I didn't have a systemic. I tried Hort Orioles. It wasn't working. I needed a systemic. I live in the woods. Like the closest garden center to me is 20 minutes away. And I didn't know what to buy. And, you know, it took me two days because I had a busy work week to even get to the garden center. And that was two days that the white flies kept reproducing. So I love this concept of having all of us at this point probably have some sort of area of our home that we keep our extra pots, our extra potting mix, you know, your little plant corner in my apartment. It used to be under my kitchen sink. Now I have a nice set of like wire shelving in my pantry that I keep it all in. And I'm so excited to just go through not just what you have to have, but why you have to have it. Because I feel like how many times do we read about neem oil, but like, what is neem oil and what does neem oil do? So with that, why don't we dive in? We're going to divide this interview into two different sections, products and gear, the products being the like oils, the more liquid stuff, the the things that are really going to fight the pests and gear being hand tools. So let's dive into products first. And I think we should start with horticultural oil. So what is a horticultural oil? When do we use it? And what's the difference between hort oil and neem oil? Because I think that causes a lot of confusion. 
Yeah, I think we could probably break down sort of the years of our friendship by all of the different texts that you've sent me about each one of these problems <laughs> and use that conversation to just build the first aid kit, right? A hundred percent. After all these years, I'm like, Maria, these are all of the things that you need to have in your first aid kit. Yeah, so... I like to keep everything we're going to talk about. I use like a tackle box or an art box, you know, something that has little compartments and a handle, like a fishing tackle box. We're going to talk about products. I like to kind of rebottle some of these products into smaller containers with a label so that I can keep them in my first aid kit. So that might be handy for those of you that don't have a lot of space, you know, to keep things closer to your plants. But yeah, where to start with products, why you're going to keep certain products on hand and what you need to use them for. So horticultural oils, this is a general term used to describe a type of product that can be made from several different types of ingredients. Horticultural oils act on pests and fungal diseases on on leaf surfaces by essentially smothering them, okay? Insects have exoskeletons with pores where they absorb oxygen. And when you put a horticultural oil on them or they come in contact with it, it essentially blocks off their, to put it very simply, breathing tubes, right? So it smothers insects. It has to come in contact with them and it smothers them. Horticultural oils can also be used to clean leaves. They can also be used to prevent and help slow the spread of of fungal diseases. You can have horticultural oils that are made from mineral oils that are going to have petroleum products in them. Sort of the old school, what we call dormant oils, which you don't see as much anymore for home plant keepers or gardeners is a heavier duty petroleum-based oil product that usually goes out in late winter when there's not a lot of foliage out. What most of us are using in the houseplant world are horticultural oils. So that could be pepper plant extract, peppermint extract, you know, it could be a mineral oil, it could be neem oil. So neem oil is a horticultural oil. Not all horticultural oils are neem oil but neem oil is a horticultural oil. So you want to look at the ingredients to make sure that if you don't want something that potentially has petroleum distillates in it, then you maybe want to skip the mineral oils, horticultural oil, and look for things like there's herb extracts, thyme, mint, pepper, and neem oil. So yes, horticultural oils can be used for a lot of different things. So a lot of the times you'll see neem recommended for cleaning. So yeah, so there's a lot of different things that you can use different horticultural oils for. You always want to read the label to see what the ingredients are to understand what you're using. But I think to break neem down, because I think this is probably going to take the longest of talking about all the products because it tends to be the most confusing. You want to make sure that you understand the difference between neem and neem oil, (laughs) because neem has essentially two important, I mean, there's more than two ingredients, but two things that you're going to be looking for. Azadiractin, which is a compound, a complex compound that is an insect growth regulator. So we could really think of that as a true insecticide in that it is going to inhibit the ability of insects to proliferate, to reproduce, right? So it's going to slow that down and help you get rid of an infestation. Neem oil does not contain that ingredient. So there's a process by which those two things are separated from one another. And you have azadiractin as a separate extract. And then what you're left with is neem oil. So neem oil does not have that active ingredient in it, but you use it as a horticultural oil. So it will smother insects, help you with fungal diseases and, and use as a cleaner. If you really want a neem product, that has a an insecticide action in it that you need to look for the ingredient as a directin. Does that make sense? So as a directin is not a natural occurring thing in neem oil. Yes, it is. It is in neem. It's in neem. Neem oil is what you get when you separate out the azadiractin, right? There is a process oh, by which you soak it. the okay. seeds. So they get soaked in like an alcohol solution. It separates those two things. So you can buy a product that has both. And that's just going to be called neem. I know it's a little bit confusing. When they're separated, it's going to be called neem oil. 
And then you need to check the label to see if that product also still includes as a direct in it, if you want that stronger insecticide action. So on an episode where we're talking about houseplant health and first aid kits, we want happy, healthy houseplants, right? And in order to have happy, healthy houseplants, you need to make sure that your plants get enough light because plants make their food through photosynthesis. So adding a grow light to your home as a way to boost your plant's light exposure and happiness is a great way to set yourself and your plants up for success. If you're looking for a grow light, I cannot recommend my friends at Soltech more. Soltech has all the different types of high quality, full spectrum grow lights that you could ever need to illuminate your home in the most stylish and seamless way, especially as we're moving into shorter days with the fall and winter. If you're looking to add a grow light, the fall and the winter is a great time to do this because the light naturally diminishes for our plants. So you can give them a little boost and they've just added another product to their line of grow lights and it's called the Grove LED Grow Bar Light. It's a grow bar, a grow bar that you can put in a bookshelf. You can put it under your kitchen cabinets for lush herbs. You can have your own herb garden in your kitchen, no matter what your light exposure is there. The Grove is designed to fill any corner of your home with a full spectrum light that will help your plants stay lush and lively. And it's touch sensitive. So it has touch dimming and the on and off switches are easy. You pop it on a timer. You don't think about it. And you have lush plants in your house all winter long. It's amazing. So they've got the Grove bar. That's like a rectangle that you can put under things to illuminate stuff. They also have a grow bulb called the Vita that twists into any existing lamp. And they also have pendant lights. You've seen their aspect pendant lights all over my home. I have three of them. So Whatever style, whatever type of grow light you're looking for, Soltech has the answer. They also have a 90-day money-back guarantee if you're on the fence and you want to try it. They offer free U.S. shipping and a five-year warranty. Who does that? A five-year warranty. And because you're a member of my community, they give you 15% off whatever grow light you want. All you got to do is use code BLOOM15, that's BLOOM15 at checkout, to enjoy a 15% discount off of any of the lights. Winter's coming, now's the time if grow lights are on your vision board. So go to soltech.com, check out all of the different light offerings they have, and then use code BLOOM15 at checkout for 15% off. Thanks, Soltech. Are fungus gnats the bane of your existence? Are they ignoring the heck out of you? We all know that fungus gnats sound when they're buzzing in your ear and around your houseplants. Well, Happy Happy Houseplant knows how annoying it is to see fungus gnats descend on your plants, and they created the answer to your problem. It's called Fungus Gnat Death Drops. What a great name. These death drops are backed by science, tested by Mandy, the owner, and are loved by their customers. I have it myself. These fungus gnat death drops are microbial insecticide with the active ingredient being BTI or Bacillus thuringiensis, which we talk about in today's episode, which kills fungus gnat larvae in the soil. So you use fungus gnat death drops as a soil drench. All you need to do is add a half to a teaspoon per gallon of water that you use when watering. And you can also use it routinely to keep fungus gnats at bay if they're a serious problem for you. Another product we discussed in today's episode that Happy Happy Houseplant makes, but she makes it cute, is neem oil. Happy Happy Houseplant has a neem oil kit that comes with a stylish glass bottle, pre-emulsified neem concentrate, so you don't have to mess around with mixing it yourself. No separating or adding ingredients. Both products are awesome. I have them both. If this episode is inspiring you to assemble your houseplant first aid kit, grab the fungus gnat death drops and or the neem oil kit and get 10% off with the code GROWINGJOY at checkout. So head to happyhappyhouseplant.com and use the code GROWINGJOY for 10% off at checkout. That's happyhappyhouseplant.com with code GROWINGJOY for 10% off. So if I'm looking at something, if I'm looking at a neem oil in the store, because we know that there's so many, if it says neem oil, I need to look at the label and make sure that as a directed is a listed ingredient because it's been separated out when it turns neem into neem oil. So we've got to make sure that it's added back in. If you want that active ingredient. If I want that active ingredient, which as directed stops the bugs from multiplying. Yes, it slows down their reproductive potential, if you will. So it sort of over applications will slow them down and make it difficult for them to keep breeding. We call that a growth regulator. 
And then what about neem oil being used as leaf shine? Because I feel like a couple of years ago, you were told there was like two different camps. There were people that used neem oil as leaf shine and said it helps your plants look healthy and happy. And then there were some people who said, no, it actually suffocates your plants and it clogs the stomata or clogs the pores. So can you bust, which one is right? You know, (laughs) our fake news buster. Can neem oil hurt your plant? Well, you know what I'm always going to tell you is that it depends, right? So there's some nuance here. Okay, so any horticultural oil, neem oil being one of them, can be used to clean or shine plant foliage that can also in turn sort of act as a prophylactic for things like fungal diseases, right? If that's an issue for you. Most of the plant's stomata are actually on the undersides of the leaf. So if you're only using that product on the top side of the leaf, then you're not really going to be, quote, clogging all of the plant pores. So I don't think you have to worry too much. You know, there are some, some stomata on the surface, right? So there will be some of that. But typically, when you read the instructions for horticultural oil, you're usually going to be instructed to rinse it off at some point, right? So usually this is especially important in the outside garden where plants may receive some hot direct sun. You put an oil on that plant and you don't rinse it off a couple of hours later and that midday sun comes out, you can actually have phytotoxicity on that plant from the horticultural oil. It just depends on the situation in the plant and the season, right? And the intensity of the heat. But usually you're going to see a recommendation to rinse that off. So always read the label If you're glopping on a botanical oil, hort oil on your plant foliage repeatedly, then that could end up sort of building up and becoming a problem for you. So wiping down with plain water now and then or rinsing your plant after the horticultural oil has come in contact with those pests and done its job is usually going to be the recommendation. But you're not clogging all the plant pores because a lot of those plant pores are actually on the undersides of the leaves. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So it sounds like the thing of like, no, be careful with neem oil. It can hurt your plant is actually more geared for outdoor plants that are going to deal with that phytotoxicity. Well, if you have a plant under a grow light, then the same thing can happen. Mm, Okay. So yeah, so same principle applies, but obviously you have to look at your environmental conditions and look at the difference between the conditions your indoor plants are growing in and the conditions your outdoor plants are growing in. But pay attention. You know, what I always try to teach people is observation skills. So there is no one recipe and I, you can use this product and I can't predict for you exactly what's going to happen in your environment. You need to learn to observe. So if you're using a horticultural oil regularly to clean or shine your plants and summer comes around and they happen to be in a west window and you notice that you're getting a lot of extra scorching on those leaves, dial that back and just use plain water to clean the leaves. Okay, got it. I'm thinking about sprays. So let's move on to fungicide because that's a big thing where I think a lot of people see brown spots on their plants and they think that it's a humidity thing. They think it's this. And a lot of people don't realize that it could be a fungal thing. And using a fungicide spraying your plant in can sometimes help with these issues. So can you talk about the fungicide bioinsecticide reason or the reason why we would want a fungicide slash bioinsecticide in our first aid kit? Yeah. So having some fungicide handy, something like a copper fungicide is sort of kind of our our classic go-to organic product. Or there are some newer biofungicides available now. What's the difference in that term? Yeah. There are a lot of fungicides on the market. And the reason there are a lot of fungicides on the market, some of them are not available to the home consumer. Some of them are only available on the commercial market, is that fungal diseases move (laughs) they're very persistent, they spread fast, and they can obviously cause you a lot of problems on your plants. If you're growing in a humid environment or using a humidifier, you're increasing the chances of fungal diseases being a problem. And they also can develop resistance to products very quickly. So there's a lot of different products because people tend to need to switch up what they're using to sort of trick the the organisms from developing resistance. So there's a lot of fungicides on the market. For home use, there's a few main ones. Again, the copper fungicides being a pretty classic go-to for those who want to stick to kind of more natural products. Those help 
reduce, again, the ability for those organisms to reproduce, right? They may change environmental conditions such that they don't, they're not conducive for that species any longer. Some of them have kill action. The bio fungicide insecticides that are coming out on the market now is they're compounds that are extracted from fermented bacteria, and they have been shown to essentially make conditions on the leaf surface or wherever you spray them less hospitable for fungal diseases. So again, it kind, they kind of act as a prophylactic. They're a good preventative. There's a little bit of kill action there too, but they're helpful for preventing things. So if you've had a problem kind of crop up on the regular, like powdery mildew or something like that, then sort of regularly using one of the new biofungicides could be a way for you to prevent that. But if you've got, say, some spots showing up on a particular plant and you're seeing concentric circles, that says to you, okay, I probably have a fungal leaf spot disease going on here. Then spraying that plant with a fungicide can help you, number one, keep it from spreading to the rest of the plant. Number two, very importantly, keeping it from spreading it to the rest of your collection. Mm, Okay. And can the fungicide say you see the concentric circles, can it reverse those circles or it's more like you're cutting those leaves off that already have too much damage and then you're spraying the rest of the plant to prevent further damage? It really depends on how far the leaf spots have grown because, you know, they'll tend to grow and the bigger they get, then that tissue that they've infected in the in the center of those circles will die out. It desiccates and you can't regrow that tissue. So if the spots are very teeny tiny, then you may be able to just go ahead and, and save those leaf powdery mildew. You can usually, if you catch it really early, you can potentially save those leaves. Sometimes they have to go completely. If those lesions, is what we call them, have gotten pretty large and are spreading pretty quickly, then you want to go ahead and cut those leaves off and just treat the rest of the plant in case there are other spores that have moved that you can't see, right? So if they're very, very teeny, you may be able to treat it and keep that leaf and keep it from spreading to the rest of the plant. If those lesions are starting to get to the size of your fingernail or bigger, then chances are you want to just go ahead and snip those leaves off and, you know, go ahead and spray the rest of the plant. And one of the products we're going to talk about is something you're going to want to use with your pruners when you're doing this, but I'll I'll wait till you're ready to talk about that. (laughs) Yeah, no, let's go right into it. Yeah. So say you need to trim leaves off of a plant that has a disease and that disease can be spreading through the plant. There's a lot of talk about cleaning your pruners right between cuts because you can easily spread fungal diseases and bacterial diseases around the plant or to other plants via your nice little snips or hand pruners. So keeping a small container of a product that you can use to sterilize your hand snips between snips is important. There is a distinction between sanitizing your pruners and sterilizing your pruners, right? Yeah. So sanitizing is cleaning so that you just be, you know, using soapy water or something like that, that cleans it, but that won't necessarily kill off microbes that can be transmitted. So what you want to do is sterilize and you're going to have to use something like a 10% bleach solution. Pros, we tend to like products like Fizan, which you can also buy. So keeping a little container of Fizan or a 10% dilution of bleach, something like that that you can use to dip your pruners into or rinse your pruners with between cuts is important to have in your first aid kit because chances are, if you're using your plant first aid kit, you may be dealing with an infestation or an infection and you don't want to spread it. Because you could spread it by continuing to cut the plant and then having the infection rub off from the pruners onto the other leaves. Okay. So soap versus Fizan. What about insecticidal soap? What's the difference between insecticidal soap and obviously oil? But I feel like you see insecticidal soap. What is that? So insecticidal soap is a kind of soap. There's lipids. And what those do is essentially break down the waxy cuticle on insects. So horticultural oils smother insects. Insecticidal soaps sort of degrade the integrity of their cuticle that, you know, not their skin, but that waxy coating that protects their body. Um, like a and scale? That, yes. Like that. Okay. It, well, there's there's lots of, of, of different insects have cuticles, right? Have coatings. And the horticultural oils, they're lipids that basically break down that waxy coating. 
and then they eventually die. So it's a different way of murdering your insects. Got it. <laughs> right. And insecticidal soaps are great. You know, when we talk about pesticides, I always recommend use the lowest impact product you can first. There's no reason to go nuclear right out of the gate if you don't have to. So insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils are always my first line of defense, right? Clean the plant, wash it off, do physical removal, which we'll talk about when we get to tools and gear. But insecticidal soaps alternated with horticultural oils are a great first line of control and prevention without having to get into heavier chemicals. And I guess this is the perfect time to yeah. transition into, into the big guns, which <laughs> I only this year in my seven years of caring for plants, this is the first year I had to kind of resort to systemics because I couldn't get rid of these white flies. So systemic, people talk about systemic. I don't think a lot of people understand what it is and how it works because it's completely different than the topical applications that we've just been talking about with oil and insecticides. So can you tell us what a systemic is, when it's time to use it, and why it works? Yeah, I think I had to give you permission, didn't I, to, to use the system? You like literally, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I should find the screenshots and put them in the show notes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so first line of defense, use the lowest impact first. If that is not working, right, then you need to graduate potentially to a heavier duty or product. All of the products we've been talking about so far are topicals. You spray them, put them on the foliage of the plant where the insects come in contact with them. Um, before we get into systemics, there may be some other topical products that contain something like spinosad, which would be another bio product mm -hmm. that it has a more direct insect kill. So that would kind of be like the next thing I would go to after some of your insecticidal soaps and neem. And then if those products are not working, if insecticidal soap's not working, horticultural oils aren't working, spinosad's not working, and you're kind of starting to pull your hair out, especially for pests like scale and mealybugs, the big suckers. That's what I call them is the big, tough suckers, okay? They latch onto your plant and they just suck the life out of it. And certain species of scale, once they develop that hard shell, it's very, very difficult, almost impossible sometimes to treat them with a topical. It just doesn't work. Okay, here's how I'd see it, plant friend. If you wanna have success with houseplants, you have to have two things. Number one, the knowledge to care for them successfully, which we give you here on the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, and healthy plants. Because bringing a poorly grown plant home that will suffer making the transition indoors is setting you and your plant up for success. That's why I am so excited to introduce you to my new favorite houseplant grower, Proven Winners Leaf Joy. Leaf Joy and Growing Joy, are you kidding me? The synergy is incredible here. So if you haven't heard of them, Proven Winners Leaf Joy is setting the standard for houseplant cultivation. I just got back from visiting their greenhouses and plant friends, you might've seen it on my Instagram. It was the series where I was in that pink jumpsuit. I was blown away. They are selecting the best plant genetics and growing them in a state-of-the-art, fancy schmancy European greenhouse. Check my Instagram reels to see me frolicking around their greenhouse with all of my dream plants. There was a sea of Monstera Thai constellation, fancy philodendron, alocasia, pink plants, green plants, variegated plants. If you have a planty wish list, I bet Leaf Joy has one, if not all, of the plants on your planty wish list because all of mine were there. And listen, I've purchased a lot of plants at this point, having this podcast for six years. And something else about Leaf Joy plants that I really appreciate is their plant tags. Their plant tags have scientific names and care guides on them. And if you're someone who struggles picking out what plant is right for you, they took the guesswork out of it. They have color-coded collections inspired by the different areas of your home. The atrium collection is for highlight plants. The cocoon collection is for low light plants and so on and so on. They make it so simple to choose plants for your home. Next time you're at your favorite garden center, look for the Proven Winners Leaf Joy plant tags. You will not be disappointed with the variety and the quality. Find plant joy in leaf joy. Head to provenwinners.com to find your local leaf joy dealer and let me know which plant you take home on socials. <music> All right, plant friends, on an episode about houseplant first aid, something that I keep in my houseplant first aid kit, which we don't go into because I have a whole section of my house that is all things houseplants, all things gardening. I always keep a Spoma organic fertilizer and potting mix 
ready to go in case I need to repot a plant very quickly. Obviously, all of my houseplants are potted in Espoma potting mix or Espoma succulent mix. All of my outdoor grow bag garden is planted up in their potting mix with Biotone starter, and then I use their tones to fertilize. I'm an Espoma stan. But they really take the guesswork out of creating the potting mix that you need. And if you have a fungus gnat outbreak or if you have a plant that needs to be repotted because you've got to freshen up the soil, putting your plants in high quality soil is a really easy way to make sure that they're getting the nutrients and the support that they need to thrive. Because when you water plants, the water dampens the soil and then the roots and the roots hairs absorb the nutrients in the soil. And Espoma products are so high quality. They're organic. There's never any sludges, never any fillers. They're the best. They're also a four-generation family-run company. They have a huge sustainability pledge, and they're the best. So as you're building out your houseplant first aid kit, make sure that their fertilizer, their indoor houseplant liquid fertilizer, which you just put into your watering can, their outdoor fertilizer, they have both liquid and granular form, and their potting mix is in there. I always have a bag of the general potting mix, a bag of the cactus mix, and a bag of the orchid mix. And then depending on what I'm potting up, I make like a little concoction of that. Most of my plants are in the potting mix. Some of my plants, some of my aeroids are in potting mix with a little bit of orchid bark. And then my succulents are obviously in their succulent and cacti mix, as are my citrus. They've got a fertilizer and a potting mix for whatever you're growing, indoors or outdoors. To learn all about their amazing products, go to espoma.com to find your local garden center near you or visit my Amazon storefront for a list of curated Espoma products that are my absolute favorite. So what you have to do is basically treat your plant with what we call a systemic pesticide. Now, There are all different kinds of systemic pesticides. There are different ingredients. Systemic is a just a general term that describes that what the plant is doing is absorbing, taking up that pesticide into its vascular system and moving it up and around the plant tissue. So what happens when that sucking or chewing insect chews on that plant, they're going to ingest the pesticide right? And that's how you get it into their system. You get it from the plant system into the pest system and it knocks them out. So it turns the plant toxic. Well, yes, essentially. Systemics are not something you want to use on your edible crops because you don't want want to be eating and consuming those chemicals, right? So you don't want to use it on your citrus trees. You don't want to use it on your lettuce. You don't want to use it on anything like that. And certain systemics have an impact on wildlife and pollinators and insects outdoors. So they should not be used in a cavalier manner. They should be used as a last resort when really necessary in specific situations. Indoor houseplants is one area that I can feel better about recommending uh, use of a systemic because the reality is you're not eating that plant and it's not outside interacting with wildlife. So that's where one of your aeroids or a croton or whatever it is that you're growing ornamentally inside that you're continuing to have a struggle with, whether it be a pest or a, or a fungal disease, that's where a systemic may come into play. Scale, white flies, mealybugs, a persistent spider mite infestation, a persistent fungal disease that you can't seem to get rid of on that plant. You know, you're cutting leaves, you're spraying, you're cutting leaves, you're spraying, and it's just not going away. Then a systemic can help you. Now, they're a lot of times going to be bundled into a two-in-one or three-in-one. So when you, even when you just see that on a label from a distance, you see three-in-one or two-in-one, oftentimes some of those are going to be systemic. So just make sure you check the label. And usually a two-in-one or a three-in-one is going to hit fungal diseases, and then it's going to hit potentially mites and then certain types of insects. Some will do insects and fungal diseases. Some will do fungal diseases, mites, and other insects. And we had talked about this in our pest episode that mites specifically are very resistant to a lot of different insecticides. Yeah, thrips are a big issue because they're very tricky and very hard to treat. There's not a lot of chemicals that are labeled that really work very well on them. And so, yeah, mites can be generally a little trickier. So if you have an actual mite issue, then you need to buy a product that is specifically labeled for mites. And that's important. You know, some products are going to be 
more effective on chewing and sucking insects, and some other products are not going to be effective on those types of insects. So you really have to read the labels and learn what's going to work on what. BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, is another bio product that's used specifically on caterpillars, worms, chewing worms. I like to use BT for houseplants for long-term maintenance of fungus gnat larvae but I find that something like hydrogen peroxide is a better knockout killer first round. Okay, so this is perfect because next on my list was hydrogen peroxide, sticky traps, and BT. So yeah, fungus gnats. That's a fungus gnats especially. I feel like when you get a fungus gnat outbreak, this is not a drill. You do not have time (laughs) to like go run to the store and get stuff. You need to be immediately attacking that outbreak before it just like takes over your entire house. So Obviously, the lowest maintenance, I guess, option is those sticky traps, which we talked about in the pest episode, the yellow sticky traps. You put them in and you catch the adult fungus gnats in the sticky traps. Can you talk about the hydrogen peroxide and BT a little bit more? Yeah, I, over many years of experimenting with different products for fungus gnat control, have found that a drench of a diluted hydrogen peroxide. So, you know, you're usually going to get a, what, a three to 5% strength hydrogen peroxide at the grocery store. You can dilute that even as little as one part hydrogen peroxide to 10 parts water. And that often is enough to really knock out most of the larva in that pot. BT is good. I find though that you just have to, like, it doesn't always just knock out the whole population. So I like to use hydrogen peroxide as a soil drench when it comes to fungus gnat larva as a big gun first round knockout. And then if you want to keep using BT as a drench for ongoing maintenance, I find that works better. And can you specify what do you mean by drench? Yeah. So when you use a systemic pesticide, you're going to use it as a drench. And what a drench means is you're going to mix that per the label parameters with water, and you're going to water the root zone with it. You're going to put it into the soil of the pot because the roots have to absorb it and take it up systemically. So anytime I say soil drench, we're applying at the root zone in the potting mix. We're in the water because we are addressing perhaps a soil-borne fungal disease, right, that's causing root rot, or we are needing the plant to take up a systemic pesticide, and that needs to be done through the roots, or we are treating a root zone pest problem such as fungus net larva or even root mealybugs. So you need to apply that into the potting mix at the root zone. Okay, got it. And I know that you said that you use hydrogen peroxide as a multi-purpose. What else do you use hydrogen peroxide as in your houseplant toolkit? You can use it for cleaning tools. You can also use it to oxygenate the root zone a little bit. Let's say you are rehabbing a plant that you've been struggling with. You can't figure out what's wrong with it. You finally pop it out of the pot and you look and you realize that, oh, I have a bunch of rotten roots here. I'm going to have to root prune a lot of this, clean it repot it, watering in with a soil drench of hydrogen peroxide can help oxygenate that root zone, which helps cut down on proliferation of disease issues. Getting more oxygen to the root zone is helpful for the plant. If you're water rooting or growing in water, a little bit of hydrogen peroxide in the water actually oxygenates it. So there's lots of different fun things you can do with a little bit of hydrogen peroxide. I love it. So it's good to keep it specifically in your first aid kit. Yeah. And If you are Leslie, you are no doubt going to cut some appendage of your body, be it fingers or toes, in the process of first aid and have to then use hydrogen peroxide. Like I dropped my hand pruners onto my toe last week when I was cutting back shrubs because, you know, I insist on gardening practically barefoot. But, you know, so it's such as life. So Band-Aids, maybe keep some (laughs) Band-Aids and and hydrogen peroxide and neosporin or something in your first aid kit for you after you've done snipping your plants. I love that. A first aid kit for your first aid kit. (laughs) Since we just talked about roots and root pruning, also uh, rooting hormone is a great thing to have in your first aid kit. I mean, it's a great thing to have in general for if you ever want to take propagations, but why should we have rooting hormone in our first aid kit? 
Yeah, not a lot of people would think to do that. But per the situation I just described, where you have a plant that you're having to do a lot of root pruning on, you have a lot of root rot or you have to prune a lot of roots away, what do you want to do? You want to encourage new root differentiation. You want that plant to have its root system grow, branch, grow new root hairs, because it's all those little root hairs that are going to absorb the water and nutrients. So a plant that's been stressed and it's lost a lot of its root system, or maybe you're potting it up into a bigger pot and you just want to give that plant a boost at the root zone, adding some rooting hormone, doing a soil drench, watering in with a rooting hormone can help stimulate root growth a little more quickly, right? So that's something I think that's really handy to have on hand, uh, especially when you're having to do root pruning. Yeah, I love it. So now let's move over to gear. We will start with something we just briefly mentioned with fungus gnats, but sticky traps. I think this was something I learned late in life as well. It's like once the fungus gnats show up, it's too late to like have to go out and buy sticky traps. They're definitely something you should have. Anything in particular that you like, any types of sticky traps that you prefer? I feel like there are no companies that are doing like really beautiful sticky traps yet. I feel like that's a hole in the market. I have some really cute ones. I have some little cute ones that are shaped like flowers and leaves that actually you stick into the pot. So old school yellow sticky traps. This comes from greenhouse culture. They're just the size of a three by five index card, yellow with a little twist tie and you hang them on plants. And essentially what sticky traps are is not in a bigger scale production. They're not for control. They're for monitoring. So they're left up regularly. And by how many insects that you find stuck to that card per square inch, that's going to tell you whether you've got a real problem or a developing problem or like a massive outbreak. So it's a monitoring tool. So they're great for you to use regularly, especially if you have a big collection of houseplants, just have a few around because that's a good observational tool for you to catch a problem before it gets out of hand. With fungus nets specifically, They are a control tool to help you catch as many adults as possible so that those adults don't keep laying more eggs in your pots. So it's a two-pronged approach. You have to treat the larva at the root zone and you have to kill as many of the adults as you can, which is hard to do because they fly around. So trying to spray them is futile. So the sticky traps come in handy when you are trying to reduce fungus gnats, the adult population, right? And also treating at the root zone to kill the larva. Okay, cool. Why don't we work our way up from like lowest to highest in gear? So let's talk about sanitation first. I know that you love a rubber glove. (laughs) I love a rubber glove. I love a cotton glove. I just found this really cool company that makes these gloves that are like towels almost, like for leaf cleaning. There's all sorts of gloves on the market. Buffer gloves. Yeah, so what do you recommend? (laughs) So... Okay, back to sort of that use the lowest impact method of control first. There's nothing lower impact than squishing first. (laughs) So when you have especially scale, which is just really a nightmare, and mealybugs, physical removal and doing some squishing, kind of stripping the stems and leaves of your scale or mealybugs is kind of the best first way to get rid of a lot of them. And you really don't want to do that with bare hands. So some nitrile gloves or rubber gloves. I like nitrile gloves because you just have a better tactile experience. You can feel what you're grabbing a little bit better than like bigger dishwashing rubber gloves. So just a good nitrile glove or nitrile gardening gloves are good. Um, Especially, you know, if you're handling product, you might want to have some solid rubber gloves, right? So if you're handling oils or any of other products, protecting your hands is important. So gloves for protecting your hands, gloves for cleaning off insects. And then, yeah, the little cotton gloves for cleaning leaves or buffing your leaves are handy. Yeah. I also always keep cotton balls and Q-tips at the ready. Yeah, I know a lot of people like to use Q-tips and cotton balls and like rubbing alcohol for mealybugs and things like that. Personally, I find that to be a little bit counterproductive. I am going to remove that meal. I'm going to squish it and remove it. And then I'm going to treat that plant for any eggs or crawlers, little tiny babies that I can't see. If I can see them, I'm going to hose them off or I'm going to physically remove them first. So going around the plant with a Q-tip and alcohol and like touching every mealybug and then leaving it there on the plant doesn't really jive with me. 
Oh, see, I'm thinking more of like a Hoya compacta that has mealybugs and you're using the Q-tip as a method of getting in there and physically removing. Get, removing them. Yes. Yeah. I've just seen a lot of people recommending like dabbing them all with alcohol. And I'm like, if you can touch that little beast with the Q-tip, you get it out, dig it out. <laughs> yeah. I've used Q-tips as like ways to get into like the crook of, you know, leaf joint or something. The axis, the leaf axis. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So using it for kind of physical removal and cleaning out is handy. And you could, you know, you could use a neem oil dip or something like that on it too. I don't like to use rubbing alcohol straight on the leaves and stems of the plant because it can damage the tissue. So I prefer not, personally, I prefer not to use alcohol directly on my plants. Okay, got it. Then alcohol makes me think sterilizing, which makes me think of tweezers and pruners and or snippers. You should have a plant specific set of snippers that you use for your plants so that it's not the kitchen it's not the kitchen right. counter set of scissors that then you're yes. going to go and like you touch know, food. You know that's what everybody does. I mean, you, you know that that's what happens. I've done that. I've done that before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, we all have. You're in the house and like you realize you need to snip something or cut something off. And gosh darn it, of course, the plant snips are not handy. So what do you do? You go digging through the kitchen drawer and you pull out the nice pair of scissors or heaven forbid you grab somebody's sewing scissors because that's a way to lose your life. Yeah. Or the good paper scissors. No, you'll blunt that, right? So you don't want to be cutting on plants with any of your other good scissors or kitchen scissors, things like that. And so again, having a little tackle box, your first aid kit handy with these things in it just is a great way to reach for the right tool instead of having to use the wrong tool. So yeah, I like to keep a small pair of very sharp, sharp snips and then a small hand pruner that can prune larger stems. Yes, exactly. I have a pink pruner and then I love the modern sprout. Like they're kind of needle nosed snippers that are very fine and they're pretty. I like those too. Yeah, those are good. Yeah. They've got a nice tiny tip so you can get in to cut off smaller stems or they're good for cutting, you know, the little peduncles off of, of inflorescence. And so, yeah, you can get tighter in there with your snips. Love it. I know that you love your foldable repotting mat. I also have one. It's so old now, but I love a folding potting mat. Always good to have a separate mat that you're dealing with all your plants and their bio controls. Well, it's nice because if you just need to, I don't know about you, I don't know about your listeners, but I'm fairly ADT. <laughs> I'm in the middle of doing something and I see a problem on a plant, I'm immediately going to stop whatever else I'm doing and I'm going to have to pick up that plant and deal with it. And it's always inevitably at an inopportune time. I'm not in gardening. I don't have anything out. There's nothing for me to put out to not get things dirty. So having one of those little fold foldable potting mats that you can snap together at the corners and just flop that down on the kitchen counter or the kitchen table and handle your project and be able to wash that off in the sink and put it back in your first aid kit is super handy. Uh, yeah, I feel like whether or not you include one in your first aid kit, I think everybody should have one. I feel like it saved my marriage because <laughs> it really does. Like, I feel like before I got one, there was just like soil everywhere. And then at least once I got the folding mat, I was able to kind of contain it, especially when we were, you know, in our tiny apartment and we had such limited I mean, our only counter space was in the kitchen. So I had to do all my houseplant chores out there. And um also, now that we have a yard, you can just hose it off outside and like hang it to dry, which is so great. So well, it's leaves, dead leaves that are dropping, whatever it is that you're pruning off the plant, all of that gets everywhere. And I think everybody that's listening, who is listening, has discovered that, you know, when you develop a good sized plant collection, even a small plant collection, they can make a mess. And so even just picking it up, moving it across the room, you've now got leaves dropping everywhere. So having a, a little temporary little station, you can just pop out really easy to keep things clean is great. Yeah, I love it. So let's dive into humidity adjusters, because a lot of times I certainly have had this issue before where I have a moisture loving plant. It's the middle of the winter. My house is 17 degrees, 17% 17 humidity. And you need to make like a little houseplant hospital, an easy way to kind of 
boost that is boosting the humidity. So you got me turned on to hygrometers. I mean, I have one in every freaking room in my house now so that I could at least monitor the humidity. But I also know that you love a humidity dome. Yeah. So hygrometers are great and it's not necessarily, I mean, I guess you could keep one in your first aid kit, but obviously it'd be better sitting out with your plants. But if you have, I mean, they're so inexpensive. If you have an extra one in your little kit, you could always pop it out and check just to confirm your observations of the environment to rule out what may or may be wrong with your plant because it may not be a disease. It may not be a pest issue. It may be a low humidity or water related issue. Look, you can kill any plant. Anybody who tells you you can't kill ZZ plants or can't kill pothos, I just before we recorded, because you know, professionals can be, we can be pretty dismissive of our plants. We have high expectations for self survival <laughs> of our plants. We're so busy helping everybody else that oftentimes it's, it's our own plant kids that get neglected. I had a, I have a, I have a pothos downstairs that just wilting, like I'll get out right now. You know, I'm like, apothos is wilting. So if you have plants that are a little diva-ish when it comes to humidity, or you just simply get busy and you forget, like we all do, or seasonally, like right now, my plants are wilting in summer in my house because in Texas, it's 185 degrees Fahrenheit outside. So what happens inside? The ACs are kicking 24-7, And what do ACs do? They pull the moisture out of the air to cool it. So it can get very dry inside. And you just forget about it because it's not winter. You know, you're you're just going about your business. So you go, oh my gosh, how am I going to revive this? Yeah, just even just a simple, I love glass domes. You know, I'm a little bit of a glass addict when it comes to growing plants. So I have tons of glass cloches and domes, but obviously those are not things you can put in a tackle box. A simple plastic bag, something that you can put over that plant, cover it up, let it revive, and then you can get it back on track as sometimes as simple as you need. And I'll link this in the show notes, but I have a a YouTube video from, gosh, I think it's two years old now, but it's how I used a plastic bag to make a a little houseplant hospital. And Mark Hatchadurian talked about it in one of his episodes from New York Botanical Garden. He makes his houseplant hospital with a plastic bag and that's how you put it in the ICU. So I'll link that in the show notes in case anybody wants to watch how I, I think mine, it was a Sananth, I think, that I resuscitated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course it was. And and yeah, sometimes you don't realize that <laughs> some of us professionals will use something very, very simple like that, like a plastic bag, like, and just create a little, yeah, triage, ICU, <laughs> you know, something that you can throw up really fast, which just essentially raises that relative humidity around that plant really quickly, which is going to reduce transpiration and help restore turgidity to your house plant. Yes, absolutely. Now, this is something that I learned also through manic texts with you. Um, The importance (laughs) right before my wedding, when I like needed to be institutionalized, I was at my wits end with this wedding planning and the 150 Hoya plants that got shipped to my house and were starting to yellow. There was just some shipping stuff. And I realized I cannot believe how many times I have used my Vita Grow Bulb from Soltech and my simple seed starting T5 grow lights as a houseplant hospital. Because another thing is when your houseplants aren't doing well, adding that additional light can really help just like adding that additional humidity. So we've chosen to include grow lights in our houseplant first aid kit because they can become so handy when you are trying to resuscitate a plant or give it a little bit of TLC. Yeah, well, you know, I'm always going to harp on light being the number one and most important input. It's the source of, you know, radiant energy is what a plant needs to do photosynthesis. It doesn't matter how much water or how much fertilizer you, you give a plant. If it's not getting enough light, chances are it's it's not going to thrive. And in your situation with your Hoya, yes, because these were your table decorations. These were your gifts and your table decorations and they couldn't go downhill. And you know what happens with succulents indoors, low light, you know, my first recommendation to you is get a grow light on these plants immediately, right? So obviously putting a big grow lamp or bulb in a kit isn't always feasible. However, what can be handy is some of the smaller little clip-on LEDs 
just one or two in there that you can just pop out, plug in and clip next to a plant just to give it a little bit of boost for a temporary period of time if need be, could be a good thing for you to have on hand or just an extra little lower wattage bulb that you have just in reserves or something that you can put into a light fixture if you need to give something a boost. I appreciate you continuing to go back to the size of stuff and like literally staying tackle box size because I'm thinking that I have a full wire four foot tall rack for all of my houseplant stuff. And I'm like, oh, my houseplant first aid kit is getting like half of the rack. So I can put my grow lights there. But yes, let's keep bringing it back to to size and accessibility. Well, mobile, I'm thinking, you know, mobile, like your little kit that you can grab and take upstairs or take to another room or take to the kitchen, wherever you need to set up and just kind of keeping everything handy. And a lot of those little clip on grow lights are absolutely small enough to just get tucked into a tackle box, you know, and just pop that out and stick it wherever you need to to stick it. So light's always going to be number one. Now, speaking of light, Let's talk about your favorite tool that I know was very important to be included in this houseplant first aid kit, your PAR meter. It's definitely more of an investment for people and you need to understand how to use a PAR meter in order to really reap the investment of one. But man, I bought one when I was taking your plant science class at UCLA and I have used it and I love it. So please take the floor to go on your PAR meter (laughs) rant that I know you've been waiting to go on. Okay, well... As a professional, my number one diagnostic tool when it comes to assessing indoor locations or greenhouse locations or areas and homes is a PAR meter. Photosynthetically active radiation is what a quantum flux meter measures. It's the actual units, the photons of radiant energy of light that are hitting the surface of a plant is what you can measure PPFD or photosynthetic photon flux density. How many of those light raindrops are falling on your plant leaves to give you an accurate idea of do you have enough light to grow this plant? So the first thing I am always going to do when I'm trying to diagnose a problem for a client or a business is look at look when I'm working on a horticultural project or just my own house plants for that matter, or if I'm starting seeds or if I'm trying to grow tomatoes inside, the first thing you have to do is figure out how much natural light do you actually have and how much do you need to add of supplemental light. You can't do that if you don't have a tool that tells you accurate information about what you have and what you don't. So granted, not everyone is going to need a quantum flux PAR meter or justify the cost of having one, et cetera. But if you are an intensive grower inside, if you're growing edible crops, if you're a hardcore orchid enthusiast, if you are running a plant business where you're doing any interior scaping, anything like that, then a PAR meter is handy. I have several different types. And of course, those are always in my stash of tools. That said, if you just need to ballpark, you can use a regular light meter. You can use light meter apps on your phone. There are apps on the phone that tell you they're giving you PPFD, but realize your phone is not a quantum flux meter. And essentially all it's doing is acting as a light meter and then using mathematical conversions to give you an estimate of PAR. So it's not exactly the same thing. You can't equate it. It's not the same unit. It's not the same thing, but you can kind of ballpark your light conditions using a light meter app on your phone. And if you want to use a light meter app on your phone, I'll make sure to put a link to the download from a very old episode that Leslie was on. It was like in the 40s. It was like in 2017. But Leslie did a great (laughs) two-part episode on understanding natural light with me way back when. And we did this little worksheet. So if you want to play around with a meter and learn how to use it and learn how to do the quote unquote squishy math, which I'll let you go listen to that episode to know what that means. We'll make sure that's linked so you can go check it out. I'm looking at our list. I'll say, oh, and last but not least. Oh, we're missing something. Last but not least, we saved the best for last because it's my most favorite, my most treasured (laughs) possession. I know what you're going to (laughs) say. The magnifying glass. I can't believe I was like, wait, is she really going to skip over the little handheld magnifier? How dare she? And (laughs) this thing is, talk about affordable. This thing is like $10 online. And it is so 
fun. Leslie introduced this to me a couple years ago. It's a magnifying glass. It's so little, it folds into itself, but it has a light on it. And so when I had my white fly outbreak, I know I talked about this on our other podcast on pests, but I couldn't identify the white flies to my eye. I'd never seen them before. I couldn't figure out what they were. And so I took an infested leaf. I took my trusty little magnifying glass like Sherlock Holmes. I turned the little light on so the leaf was illuminated and that's how I was able to diagnose my plants. And I know from when we were doing the Garden Society and we talked about it, there were multiple, I remember Tony, one of our dear plant friends, she got a magnifying glass and she was like, oh my God, I looked at my plants and I have all these pests that I didn't know about. And I know that was stressful for her. Sorry, Tony, we love you if you're listening, but it's such a useful, I feel like it's such a useful Thing to use. I love it. They have little carrying case and it's just a little circular magnifying glass that kind of whips out of a little carrying case. And some of them have little LED lights on it so you can light them up. And there are different levels of magnification. I recommend going to the higher end of magnification because to really identify things like thrips, which are teeny tiny and like to hide, they're super handy. You can also get a really good look at spider mites. Oftentimes, you really aren't going to notice the pest itself, right? Signs and versus symptoms. You're not really going to necessarily see the sign, which would be like the actual insect or eggs or something like that, because they're so tiny until the problem has progressed to the point where you have a lot of plant symptoms that could be problematic. So when you're doing your weekly or monthly observation of your plants using your magnifier glass is great. But if you notice a problem on a plant and you're trying to figure out what's wrong, yeah, whip out that little magnifier and take a close look because you might be really surprised to find some critters there that you just did not see, you know, at casual glance. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a high to wrap this episode up on, Leslie. Did we miss anything? We actually missed one thing. And the only reason I bring it up, I don't use them, but that's because of my level of experience. But I will say if you are more of a beginner, you may want to have a moisture meter in your kit. Ah, yes, a moisture meter. Yeah, because that, especially when you're first learning how different plants uh, respond in your environment to water and really kind of learning how water columns work in different containers and drainage and all of that, using a moisture meter in your earlier days can really help you get a better intuit whether your plants are getting not enough or too much water. So a moisture meter might be nice to throw in there too, and it'll fit in the tackle box. I love it. Yes, I do also remember many years ago, you suggested I get a moisture meter. I got one also very affordable online. And uh, I just like ran around in between all my pots being like, I can't believe, because I think the thing you don't understand when you have big pots is that, yes, the top two inches of soil are dry, but actually the four inches under are not dry yet. So it is a very fun tool. It's a fun education tool to like get your hands literally dirty and explore a little bit more. So I hope this episode lit you plan friends up as, as as much as it lit me. I'll have links to everything in the show notes and in the blog in case you guys want to poke around. We intentionally kind of kept this brand agnostic, but we'll give you a couple of options for stuff. And Leslie, as per usual, you're my favorite. I love having you on the show and I love you. <laughs> I hope we filled everybody's first aid kit up with all the little goodies that they're going to need to keep their plants healthy. And yeah, hopefully some of these tips will get everybody um, on track and, and make them feel more confident about hitting those first aid needs for their plants. Yes, because it's not if, it's when. You will it's have your when. first outbreak. It is part of life. It does not make you a bad plant parent. Everybody gets a pest outbreak. Everybody gets a houseplant hospital moment. And it's just about being prepared. So another thing, plant friends, is if you like it when Leslie comes on the show, you should DM me and tell me what other episodes you might want to hear her on so that I can keep luring her back. <laughs> <laughs> She's good at talking me in to coming back if there's a fun topic. So I can typically be persuaded if there's something fun that Listeners actually want to hear me talk about. Exactly. So let me know. Those DMs are open. The DMs are open, plan friends. So L Leslie, thank you. Oh, wait, hold on. I got to say one more thing. Obviously, yes, tackle box, the tackle box is full. But if you want to really up your houseplant kit, you must have Leslie's books. Oh. You must have <laughs> Leslie's books in your houseplant first aid kit. 
I have gone back to gardening under lights and plant parenting so many times over and over and over again and tiny plants because you have so much humidity stuff. So can you just tell us about your books? Because if you guys don't have Leslie's books, like you have to have her books. So walk us through all of them because you've written like 4 billion of them. Very sweet. Gardening Under Lights obviously goes into the science behind plant lighting. If you really want to dig into understanding how light works and lots of different grow lights and grow lighting strategy indoors for lots of crops. In relation to our episode today, I have a big table in the middle of the book that covers pests and diseases, what they look like, what they do to your plants and how to treat them from a very general perspective. So there's like a big table in there you can reference in Gardening Under Lights. Plant parenting is all about propagation. There's lighting strategies, plant care strategies, in plant parenting as well. And then, yeah, if you love to grow humidity divas, then you might want to dig into tiny plants because I focus on a lot of tiny high humidity divas. And if you've been frustrated with the bigger high humidity divas in tiny plants, I show you how to go small with humidity divas. And they're like the easiest plants to grow when you do it the way that I show you how in tiny plants. So yeah. Yes. And we'll make sure those are all linked in the show notes too. Thank you. All right, my friend, until next time. Until next time. And you know, there always will be another time. Hopefully, fingers crossed, always. (laughs) (laughs) Love you. Love you too. Thank you, Leslie. This episode was so good and kind of was inspired by our other episodes. So if you haven't listened to Leslie's other episodes on this Grow Better series we put together, Go back and listen. There's an episode on houseplant pests. There's an episode on diseases. There's an episode on general like houseplant mistakes people make. It's such incredible content. We also have blogs on our website from them in case you like reading instead of listening, but I suggest doing both. Check Leslie out on her socials, on her website. Everything is linked in the bio and get her books if you want to set yourself up for success. I cannot tell you how many times I've had like a pest outbreak or like a leaf turn yellow or something weird happen. And I always tend to pull out one of Leslie's books to check as a reference material. So they're great books to keep on your planty bookshelf. Like I said, we've got a blog. We've got links to everything we discussed. We've got some coupon codes to things we've discussed in the show notes and in the blog. So check that out if you end up building your own houseplant first aid kit. And please show us on Instagram or in the Growing Joy Garden Society. Tag me and Leslie on what your kits look like, what you end up ordering. I'm so curious. I hope everyone who listens to this episode also gets that magnifying glass because it's so fun. I'm uh, so weirdly nerdy about it, but it's like, I think on Amazon right now, it's less than $10. It's been the best investment ever. And I hope this episode helps set you up for success for those dreaded moments that we all go through (laughs) when we're like, oh boy, I need to fix this stat because I'm here to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. 
you can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. (music) 